Welcome to Channel 17, the Town of Colony Government Channel. Welcome to the Artist Corner. My name is Ann Stutzman and today I'll be your host. I'm standing with Jason Middlebrook, a local artist. Jason is in the process of putting together an exhibit at the SUNY Albany Art Museum. And the title of this exhibit is Living with Less. We're going to talk to Jason about his work. Jason, could you tell us a little bit about the exhibit and about your background and how you came to this point in your life as an artist? Yes, thank you. Um, I, uh, I, grew up, I grew up in Northern California. Um, I moved to New York in the mid-90s uh, to kind of pursue my art career. Was educated in, in San Francisco and the Bay Area. And um, it's kind of a long journey how I made my way to upstate New York, but I spent about 10 years, my wife and I spent about 10 years in Brooklyn, and um, I came to a point where I needed to get out of the city. I needed, I needed to get back to nature. I grew up in Northern California, um, and so nature was a big part of my upbringing. I wanted to raise a family. I started coming upstate on the weekends, and we found this wonderful farmhouse and we bought it. And um, lo and behold, I kept working in this, in this kind of relationship between man and nature. My work has always been about man, kind of in its collision with nature. And there's always been a, a somewhat of a recycled, reusable element to my work. Um, and that was about five years ago when I moved to Hudson. I live, in, I did live just outside of Hudson. And, uh, I started looking at some of the different museums and venues around the Hudson Valley and I, I had always been showing in New York City and in Europe and in La California and I really, being, being kind of an upstate artist, I wanted to participate in a more local kind of community, art community. And I met uh, Corinna and Janet um, about a year ago and I saw the space and I absolutely fell in love with the space. Um, the, the, the kind of verticality of the space, the, the columns. And we talked a little bit about potentially doing a show. And I have been invested in these kind of recycled community-based installations, I call them. And I started thinking about what the university uses, what comes through the university on a daily, monthly, yearly basis. And I wanted to do something that would, would draw some awareness to the students, to the faculty, to the institution, and what better than cardboard. So most of this cardboard is, consists of food boxes, book boxes. That's, that's about 90% of it on a daily basis. And my first original idea was that I wanted them to accumulate one year's worth of cardboard. And we started looking, they started researching how much cardboard that would be, and the, and the university said it's impossible, it'd be so much cardboard that they couldn't possibly store it, they couldn't manage it. So all in all, what we, what we determined, this is about two and a half months worth of cardboard that comes through the university on a daily basis, and the majority of it is collapsed boxes. And so this piece that you're looking at here is about 80% finished, and um, we're kind of giving it away when we film it. I mean, it'd be probably better if, well, we should film the bottom. So, <laughs> because essentially it's going to be this kind of magic, magic trick, which is it's going to be a cardboard column, which is to simulate, you know, just, just, just to give the faculty and the students a little glimpse into how much volume of cardboard we're talking about. And um, so I wanted to play with the verticality of the space, the verticality of the school, the, the quantity of 
of material that is used in the university setting of an 18,000 student university. And I wanted to make this kind of magical piece of art, like how'd you do it? And so that's the primary element of this show and how I kind of came to that. I, I generally like to work in a way where I address a space and then I address a problem within that space or within that school. It's not that the cardboard's a problem, but in terms of a social awareness issue, I wanted the students to start thinking about the volume of stuff it takes to run a university. Um, so that's a long-winded answer of your question. <laughs> and the ultimate destination for the cardboard. Yeah. After it's. Yeah. After and it's been used, where does it go? Yeah, it it, it gets recycled, uh, you know, after this. So, so the the beauty of the show for me is take something that's on its way to the recycling center, stop it in its tracks, and make some art out of it and make a statement about that on its way to its final destination, which inevitably it will become another box. And could I just ask you, what is the ultimate dimension of this, height-wise? Uh, it's 35 feet high. And um, when it's finished, this basin that we're looking at here will span out past these columns. So you're going to get this real mushroom effect that's just going to shoot straight up. and. Um, it's hard to estimate the weight, but it's, it's going to be a few tons of cardboard. Um, and, and, you know, it, the space really inspired the kind of object. And, uh, Janet Riker is the director of the University at Albany Art Museum. And Janet would like to give us her perspective on Jason Middlebrook's upcoming show. Janet, thank you. Well, we're delighted to be able to work with Jason Middleburg, who is an artist whose work I've been interested in and following for many years. Um, this particular project is really interesting to us because it involves a number of different offices on the campus, and it involves a number of different aspects of what we do here at the university. Um, the University at Albany is kind of like a small city. Um, and we go through mountains of cardboard every day. And so when Jason proposed to us the idea of a project that would really focus on the, um, the card, on recycling that would happen here at the university, it was very exciting. Um, we worked with uh, the director of the sustainability program here at Albany, at University at Albany, and also um, people in facilities and grounds who were very helpful to us in making it possible for us to collect the tons of cardboard that um, the university uses in, in a very short span of time. And Jason has made, that, made, it, made it sort of very obvious to us how much cardboard everybody uses in the course of, of their life and their daily their daily comings and goings. So what we have is book cartons and food cartons, and, and we don't have any like used pizza boxes from dorms. We avoided that <laughs> for obvious reasons. But I think it's a very graphic um, demonstration of, of the cardboard and the waste that, that is generated by daily life and by business. Um, the other thing that was exciting to us about the project is we were able to involve a lot of students in addition to involving um, staff and collecting cardboard and bringing it here to the museum and making it possible for Jason to collect. We involved students actually in the creation of the exhibition. So we've had students from the University at Albany uh, sculpture department and then we've also had a number of student volunteers and interns who've been here working with Jason, um, cutting cardboard and making it, um, making the installation possible and working with our exhibition staff as well. So we really think of the project as involving more than just the museum but involving the campus of the whole and a lot of the students. So we think it's going to be a very popular exhibition because so many people were involved here with it. Um, it will be on view through April 5th. Um, and so there's lots of opportunities to get to the museum and get to the campus and see it. Jason, we're upstairs in the gallery. Could you tell us something about 
these pieces? Uh, yeah, I, I started on these first when um, I started coming to the university and picking up truck full, truckloads full of cardboard. And I wanted to create a system so I could kind of suture them together. Um, and once again, responding back to this space, uh, I was kind of addressing this notion of verticality. And you've got these bays in this space, these four bays, and then you've got four on that side. And, and so I wanted to kind of occupy the space of these four bays. And three of these vertical pieces are essentially the same. They're kind of a view, that classic view of flying into to a city, a city like New York or Los Angeles or Chicago, where you get that kind of endless sea of population. And so there was a direct relationship for me between these kind of slices of the night sky and the verticality of the cardboard. The cardboard representing somewhat of a skyscraper, these representing skyscrapers in themselves, and the duality of population here and the physical verticality of the actual object. And so when this is said and done, you're going to have a sea of, of population here. And as the cardboard scans to the top, you'll see stars and constellations at the top. And so um, when you really get back from this, this whole wall makes up kind of a composition as if you're flying over a city at night, where you've got in one, in one moment of your eye, you've got the stars, and then you've got humanity down below. Um, and some of this is kind of a recurring theme in this show. The cardboard representing kind of humanity and, you know, the, the verticality is, is kind of the endless, our endless um, volume of, of, of material and objects that we, you know, consume and go through on a day-to-day -day basis. So these, these four bays uh, will be occupied by this. And then we're going to lead over here. These pieces are, they're all from 2008. Um, these are, they might not be in this arrangement when you, when you finally see them in their, in their resting spot. But they were originally made for a show I had in October with my gallery, Sarah Meltzer, in New York City. And they're all reclaimed um, wood from, Colum from the Berkshires and Columbia County. And what I've gone ahead and done is, is kind of massed out my own kind of wood grain on each one of these planks. Um, they're kind of a combination between painting and sculpture. Um, and I'm not quite sure where they fall into, and that's why they kind of lean, almost like these totems, like these folk totems. I find them to be very, very much about folk art. Um, and, and for me, it's also, uh, they have a similar relationship to these vertical cardboard pieces in that I'm kind of marking these pieces. I'm taking the cardboard, I'm sewing it together, I'm painting it black to indicate the night. The bottom of it is the city, the, the kind of the span of humanity. The top of it is the heavens and the stars. In these pieces, it's kind of like I'm imposing my own vein, my own grain on the pieces of wood. Each one of them is a different type of tree, um, a different type of grain. Some of them reference kind of op art, some of them reference graffiti, like the one on the back. Um, and once again, there's a sense of verticality that they represent trees. Um, you've got the columns, and so they're kind of feeding off this idea of, of, of these erect forms. Um, across the way there is a wall drawing that kind of connects back into the idea of constellations and this kind of infinity idea of infinity in space. So it will have a connection to the, to the population and the urban on the, on the right wall. And then the left wall um, will kind of be this peak into, into, into deep space. Um, in the West Gallery, there's going to be an installation um, that's, that's not built yet where all the boxes have had windows cut out of them like little buildings. And there'll be a big pile of buildings with Christmas tree lights up inside them. And that, that, that should be pretty beautiful. Um, when it's when it's completed, there's also going to be a mobile that hangs in the center of this bayed window, a mobile made from driftwood found um, on beaches, 
and then there'll be um, another, another few sculpture, a few benches, a few recycled benches. And then downstairs will be 11 drawings, some of them spanning back to 2002 up to 2008. Um, and that's, that's kind of the gist of, of the show. The, the, um, the totems are, are absolutely beautiful. What sort of process do you use to put your own grain on these? Um, can we go closer to them? Um, it's kind of a combination of, um, as you can see, here's the back of one. They're untitled painted plank. Um, this is actually missing a component because it has a cast antifreeze bottle. But you can see here, there's a lot of tape. Um, there's a lot of mixture in the paint. You can see the reds and the blacks. And I tape them off with a really fine um, kind of um, artist painter's tape, kind of like a sign maker's tape. And then it's a, it's, a, it's a process of painting over and over. There's a lot of green here. And the tape is really what does the trick because it's such good tape and you, I apply a lot of pressure so when it comes off it creates a really sharp line which mimics the potential line of the, um, of the wood itself. So I just, I title them Untitled uh, Painted Plank because it's, this, this piece for me, there's a lot of ambiguity with these things and I think that's in some ways why they're successful. You know, people aren't sure what to make of them, whether they're totems, whether they're paintings, whether they're sculptures. Some of them, this is I believe cherry. Um, this, I believe, is cottonwood. And they kind of also, I grew up in California, so there's this kind of reference to surfboards. And, and um, this one started out as a landscape as well. If you look at it horizontally, it kind of has the same appeal of a, of a kind of skyline at night. But then I thought it worked so much better vertically. Um, this one is the same silver paint that you see on that wall. It started as something else. There were leaves on it, but I didn't like the way that was going. And it finished up like this. And then this one was a little more time consuming. I believe this is walnut. This is like bird's eye walnut. It's a beautiful piece of wood. And um, yeah, they're pretty labor intensive, but the result is they get waxed afterwards and treated. And then there's that one. There's one more. I'm going to do one more down there for the exhibition. A lot of these, uh, like I said, I was, I had, you know, pallet after pallet of cardboard in my studio. And, um, you know, as an artist, I've always kept a drawing book and I've had a drawing, I've had a drawing book. I go through them one or two a year. I've got a, you know, a couple dozen of them in a, in a bookcase at home. And there's always little notes that you write down. You hear stuff on the radio, you read something in a book, you think up something when you're driving. You know, I, I believe in like free form ideas and sometimes these ideas become an art piece, sometimes they don't. And most of the time they don't. Most of the time they're just things you hear that, that were amusing. And I wanted to do something with this cardboard that gave me kind of a voice outside of making a painting. And so some of these, some of these kind of deal with current events, such as Katrina or 9-11, where things that I start thinking about when there's a saturation of an idea. Some of them deal with reactionary things like, why is Whole Foods so expensive? It shouldn't be that expensive. You know, it should be cheaper for us. We all should eat better. So some of them are an exaggeration of an idea that I might have had. Um, the kind of concept behind the show deals with this word play, which is Alive with Less. The show is actually called Live with Less. But I'm, I'm fascinated with language in the way if you take away the A, Live with Less, is a lot different than Alive with Less, but it's very similar in some ways. And that's kind of been the message of my work in the last, in the last few years, is that not only do we have less, we need to live with less at the same time. And that might mean 
money, time, you know, the environment, everything. It applies to everything. Um, and I kind of like, I like that kind of concrete word, that concrete phrase that kind of makes up a lot of, a lot of my art practice. Um, this is also a very green statement. It makes sense to build in cities because it's less of an environmental impact to keep building up than to build out and keep cutting down trees. Um, this is kind of, uh, you know, I, I've, I'm interested in geology. I'm interested in time and how time gets compressed and that everything, our bodies are made up of compressed energy and everything below us is compressed energy. Um, my daughter helped me make a couple of these. This kind of plays with, with a sign that maybe a homeless person has. We'll work for food. We'll work for beer. We'll work for good ideas. So as an artist, I'm always striving for a better idea. Um, humor is a big, part of my, a, a big part of my practice. Obviously, golf is a big part of my practice. So I do believe I'm a better artist than Tiger Woods. <laughs> Uh, my mother always said this to me, say no to something three times a day. That's a good one. Um, Christo is one of, my famous, one of my favorite artists, but his drawings are about $200,000 a piece. So, you know, all these things are, I am a good artist, is, is to remind myself whenever I have a doubt that I am a good artist, but maybe I'm not that good. So this is kind of a, a self-reflective, critical thing. Um, this whole front gallery will be covered with these signs. From, from floor to ceiling as kind of an entranceway into the show for people to kind of stop and think about these. Um, like I said, some of them are really funny. Andy Warhol, why do people think artists are so special? It's just another job. Some of these things I've kept for years. I left New York City and this is kind of a critical way to look back at New York City. Can New York City ever get over itself, you know? Um, Anyway, I wanted, to, I wanted to talk about these a little bit so you guys have an understanding of, of how my brain works. <laughs> so just more of the same, here's the Live With Less, which is kind of the title, the title of the show. Like I said, it's the wordplay with the one on that side. Um, I'm a huge bird watcher, and I've got three acres in Columbia County, so this means a lot to me. Um, Observing nature and raising a family, there's a real, there's a real big difference. Um, this kind of relates to, for me, like, you know, the conflict in the Middle East, the, the, the idea of kind of global struggles, that Americans are, are an entirely different type of mindset when it, terms, it comes to our culture. Um, this is the funny one that plays with, um, you know, why should I lie? I just need a beer. Why should I lie? I just need to make art. In nature, suffering is part of the deal, which is very, very important. Kind of connects to this. This one's really funny. It's not a very good one. I have to repaint it. My brother is a scientist. He did some math for me. I, we figured out the exact um, dates of dates of the February for 4009, 2,000 years after my show. So once again, this kind of deals with time. Are we going to be here? Is you, SUNY Albany going to be here? Et cetera, et cetera. Um, there's still more to be made here. This, like I said, this will all be full. But some of these are kind of statements and some of them are kind of questions. And some of them are kind of stupid and some of them are kind of wise. So it's, it's kind of a way for me to, to get ideas out without actually, have, like I said, having to make the things. Um, this one I kind of like. I was once invited to be in a show on a boat. I stuffed a case of empty wine bottles with a message and then threw them overboard. The message in each bottle said, please recycle. <laughs> so, you know, it's, it's, it's a very, they're very goofy in a way, you know, and, but, but the idea is that you litter with the hope of sending a message, you know, and, and so um, this one I've always kept with me when I was in art school. An old painter once told me it takes 15 years to learn how to paint. And um, I always, I always thought, well, that's a century, but after you live a while, 15 years is nothing. And she was absolutely right. Um, this one I love. In every walk with nature, one recycles, one, one, re one receives far more than he seeks. John Muir, another, another great mind, a great naturalist of the West. Um, an artist once told me this, when I first moved to New York, all you need is one good idea. And that's kind of been sticking with me lately. Sometimes if you think about the hist history, 
Um, there's a lot of truth in that. When it comes to architects, when it comes to scientists, when it comes to great minds, sometimes all they had was one good idea, but it was enough to carry them through their whole career and have a major impact. I really believe strongly in this one, the harder you work, the luckier you get, because art making is kind of an odds game for me, for most artists, I think. Um, anyway, uh, though, like I said, there's going to be a lot more, and, and surprisingly, they're more time consuming than they look. Well, you, your art is very thoughtful, but you also seem to have a great sense of humor. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's not so much cynicism as it is, I think humor is, a, is a, a highway to the mind. Like, if you can make someone laugh, it's as important as if you can make them think, you know. And my work, I don't ever want my work to be that serious, but the, the, the ramifications of what I'm dealing with are serious. Yeah, and so these, like I said, are kind of been an outlet. Um, this is one of my favorites. This is an idea for a public commission. Public commission idea, make an old faithful going off in the center of town, random schedule. <laughs> Once again, this idea that you can't control nature. They've got at Yellowstone old faithfuls down to a schedule. You know exactly when it's going to go off. And uh, this one's just really stupid, obviously. This represents being living upstate. <laughs> um, yeah, so that's, that's, pretty, that's pretty much it in this room. This is a drawing from 2008. Um, it's entitled, um, Inspired by the Countless Trips from My House to My Studio. And I've been dealing with this kind of homemade architecture in my work for a number of years. This is inspired by a series of shanty towns in the third world, like Juarez, Mumbai, different parts of, the, of, of these kind of shanty town clusters. And um, I wanted to include it with the cardboard, because cardboard in the third world is a very valuable resource. It becomes shelter. It can become structure in many, in many places. And it's such a strong material when it's, when it's used in the correct way. Um, and I'm very fond of this drawing because it's, for me, it's, it's kind of a different type of population. It's a different type of population cluster um, than we're used to seeing in America. It's a, it's a, and it's also kind of this made up organic form. A lot of my drawings start out as one thing and they kind of evolve into, into um, something as, as they go along. I don't know if you can see in here, but there's quite a lot of sustainable references in this drawing. Um, there's a, a couple cisterns on people's roofs. There's obviously a lot of satellite dishes. This person's got a wood stove, their laundry. Um, this person's got a garden and a cistern on top, another wood stove. This person's catching their drain water from their uh, downspouts. This water here is being caught in a trough and these buckets go up and down. So there was, the, there was um, a little bit of a sense of community here. People kind of living off the land people with limited resources living together in, in one kind of mass consumption of, of population. Um, there's also a ser another shantytown cardboard piece I'm working on for the show in my studio. I'm not sure if I'm going to be able to get it finished because these are really labor intensive. This took me about three weeks, this drawing, because you, know, you can only do a certain section at a time. Um, um, some of the other drawings are, um, these are older drawings from others, other, other series. This is a drawing um, from the same series of 2008 called Getting Off the Grid is Hard to Do. So you've got this kind of, you know, ideal cabin somewhere far away. And then there's this geological kind of pop vein that runs right through the cabin. This is um, a series of drawings I did that address the Alaskan pipeline. This itself is the pipeline. It's hard for me to talk about this out of context, um, but this one is kind of this, once again, this geological energy force. You've got a lot of fossils. You've got anatomy in there. Um, this one, too, 
was part of a commission I did in London, and this is um, a study for this kind of like ge geological and uh, um, kind of scientific matter on, that's on this kind of super highway. Um, over here, you have more paintings for the show on, that are on the collapsed cardboard as well. A couple birds, a couple like cities. We haven't figured out how we're going to hang that part of the gallery yet. Thank you for joining us today on the Artist Corner. I'm Ann Stutzman, your host, and today I was very fortunate to spend the afternoon with Jason Middlebrooks, an artist, a local artist, who is having a show at the University at Albany Art Museum through April 5th. Thank you, Jason. Thank you, Ann, and um, I hope people get a chance to see it. I, uh, I feel like it's, um, it's something that we're all aware of this this kind of green movement but um the idea that you can the idea that you can play with material or or make something out of material that would normally be discarded is uh, is my goal to, to kind of stop people in their tracks so so um please please come see it and please enjoy thanks